Welcome to this edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're in the Gospel of John, continuing our verse by verse study. Through John, we come today to John chapter 16, and we resume our study in verse 12. So get your Bible, open it up to John chapter 16. The Word of God is the most important thing. It is the greatest gift that God has given us, apart from himself. And in a sense, it is himself, because it contains the mind of God, even the emotions, the will of God. It contains his will for us, and it is through the Word of God that we have fellowship with our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit wrote the Holy Scriptures, Old Testament and New. So he is our teacher. All we can do is give out God's word straight so that he can take it and use it and convict the sinners and bless the righteous. So we pray in Jesus' name that that's what would happen today and that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. John 16, verse 12, Jesus says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. The apostles had a lot to learn, a lot of things that they really needed to know. But we can only take in so much spiritual truth. We only have the capacity to take in so much truth and process it. And so God gives it to us in increments. But here's the deal. Here's why it's so important to stay in God's word. Because the more truth you take in, the larger your capacity to contain truth becomes. It's like your spiritual stomach stretches and God can put more food in there, which you assimilate into your soul, into your mind, your emotions, and your will. Like the body assimilates the food that we put in the stomach, the Holy Spirit takes the word of God that we put into us And we assimilate that into our spirit and our soul. And then we can live it out. But we have to stay in the word because we can't take it in all at once, you see. We got to put ourselves in a position where we can learn more and keep feeding ourselves. So Jesus says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but will, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. So the apostles were given all truth. Jesus said, The Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. He's talking specifically to the apostles here. And what this is, is a promise of divine inspiration. They needed to know all truth. It's not that they fully grasped everything, but the Holy Spirit gave them all truth. And then the apostles who wrote the New Testament were able to recall it, retain it, and inspiration, which is taking the truth of God's revelation and transferring it to paper, that's what inspiration is. That was guaranteed by Jesus right here so that they wouldn't make any mistakes when they wrote out the word of God that the Holy Spirit gave them. And we have it, and it's what we're looking at today. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the rest of the New Testament, all inspired 
by the apostles or by the Holy Spirit to the apostles and their companions that they gave the message to in some cases. Just like the Old Testament, all every single book in the Old Testament inspired by the Holy Spirit and given to the Old Testament prophets. And so we have the complete word of God. We have all truth. We do. We have all the truth that God intends for us to have. The Holy Spirit guided the apostles into all truth. If we needed another book of the New Testament, the Holy Spirit would have given it to us through the apostles. But he closed it up with the ones that we have. And he says as much in the last book, the last chapter, last paragraph, Revelation. That's it. We got it all. Just as Jesus said, verse 14, speaking of the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. You can tell when the Holy Spirit is speaking through someone because they're talking about Jesus. They're lifting up Jesus. They're glorifying Almighty God by doing that. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. You know, you go to some churches, it's all about the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. That's not inspired by the Holy Spirit. That's pure flesh, trying to get people's attention. It's great for theatrics, but it's not Bible. If they were really under the control of the Holy Spirit, they'd be speaking about Jesus. Any preacher or teacher who in their sermons talks more about themselves, God help us, or their denomination, which is just nauseating, or their religion or their denomination about, more than they talk about all these other things, or their psychology. It could be any number of things nowadays. Drawing attention to themselves with their great intellect, and they're words that nobody understands. That's not a commendable thing to do, you know. I heard a very famous pastor who, who is now dead, theologian who is now dead. He always uses these huge words. I've seen videos of him. These huge words, and he talks about it. And he's very proud of it. He was very proud of it. He says, of course I use these huge words because I want to teach you new words. Why? That's not what a pastor is supposed to do. Teach people new words. Show off your great intellect. Oh, we're impressed. Great. We don't understand what you said. We sure were not fed the word of God. But we're impressed with you. That kind of garbage. That has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't do that sort of thing. The Holy Spirit makes the word of God simple and points people to Jesus Christ, which the Word of God will always do if it's communicated correctly. Verse 15, Jesus says, All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he, the Holy Spirit, will take of mine and declare it to you. Jesus has things that he wants to say to us. If you are a Christian, then there are things that the Lord Jesus Christ wants to say to you. And the Holy Spirit, his messenger, is the one who communicates that truth, those truths from the written word of God. The Holy Spirit tells us what Jesus wants us to know. If you're reading the word of God or you're listening to the word of God being taught like you are today and something clicks in your mind, that is Jesus' message to you through the agency of the Holy Spirit. 16. Jesus says, A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me, see me because I go to the Father. In a little while, Jesus says, You will not see me. That little while was coming up real fast because it's Holy Thursday night. And that little while will come to an end 
when Jesus is arrested and crucified, and that's when they will not see him. They will not be with him. But then, like he says here, after another little while, Jesus will be raised, and he will come to them, and they will see him again. The resurrection and the crucifixion had been foretold by Jesus, but it really had not clicked in the minds of the apostles. So the words of Jesus, even here, are a little confusing to the apostles. Because look at verse 17. Then some of his disciples said among themselves, What is this that he says to us? A little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. And because I go to the Father. They said, therefore, what is this that he says a little while? We do not know what he is saying. Nobody could ever convict these apostles of his of being geniuses because they certainly did not give any evidences, any evidence that they were. Not the sharpest people in the world. Jesus told them about his crucifixion, his betrayal. Many times he talked about it about his upcoming death in Jerusalem. And he even talked about his resurrection, too, in the past. I don't know, he used plain language, but it didn't sink in. Sometimes truth doesn't sink in right away. And so they kept asking, what does he mean? And all of them were asking that. What does he mean? You'd think it would have stuck in one of their brains. But they all kept asking, what does this mean a little while? We don't understand what he's saying. A little while, a little while. It seemed to them that Jesus was speaking in riddles about this. A little while and you will not see me. Then a little while you will see me. And I point this out. And I'm making kind of an issue of it. So that you will understand. That even though you really love Jesus... You do, or you wouldn't be watching this program. And you love his word. I know you do, or you wouldn't be watching me. Unless you just happen to stumble upon it. Don't be, don't be down on yourself if the word of God puzzles you sometimes. That's why I'm talking about it a little bit longer than what I normally would. Don't feel discouraged when God's word has you puzzled. Because there are certain things in the Word of God that we just don't understand. And sometimes we get puzzled. But don't quit reading. Don't quit studying the Word of God because this happens to everyone. It happened to the apostles. Don't be shocked if it happens to you. That's why Jesus said, remember when we first started today, Jesus said, I got many things to say to you, but you're not able. Some of those things that have you puzzled, you're just not able. It's, you, you're still processing other stuff, you see. You're, you're not at that point yet. But if you stay close to Jesus and you stay in the Word, you will get to that point. Every time you read the Word of God, whether you feel zapped with a spiritual energy or enlightenment, you know, or not, The Holy Spirit is feeding you more and more truth. And your capacity to take in truth keeps growing more and more. Every time you read, every time you and I get together, it happens. Sometimes it's beneath the surface and you don't get, sometimes every now and then, right? Something will just jump out at you from the Word of God. Well, that's wonderful. But it doesn't always happen that way. And sometimes there's a whole lot of stuff that you and I don't know. I certainly don't. I'm not going to worry about that. I'm just going to stay in the Word, keep studying, keep teaching. Because I know the Holy Spirit continues to teach me. Just as He continues to teach you. You just, you're not going to get it all at one time. It'll it'll be a life it's a lifetime process of learning God's word and God's will. And that's okay. That's a good way to spend your life. Nineteen. Now Jesus knew 
that they, they desired to ask him. And he said to them, Are you inquiring among yourselves what I said? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And look at verse 20. Most assuredly, I say to you, that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice, and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. So Jesus says, when the world is happy, then you're going to be sad. But later on, you will be happy, and the world will be sad. In other words, the bad times for Christians are good times for the world. On the surface, then, the unsaved, seem to be doing rather well in those times. And they seem to be very successful. And they probably are. But that's because they are following the ungodly current of the day and the world. Meanwhile, Christians, if you're living for Jesus, you're going to feel out of place because you are going against the sinful, unspiritual, unbiblical current that is most popular in the world. Of course you're going to be struggling. It's not going to be smooth sailing because you're going against the current. So don't be surprised if you feel sad and frustrated. And Jesus gives us an example of this being true. He said, meaning the world rejoiced when he was crucified. But meanwhile, his followers were shocked and horrified and sad. But that switched around. The Roman soldiers, the religious leaders, were the ones who were in the panic when Jesus arose from the dead, and his people were just thrilled. 21. A woman, Jesus says, when she is in labor, has sorrow, because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Jesus is saying, some things are worth waiting for, you know. And some things are worth experiencing pain to get. But after the pain is over, when the pain is done, boy, they're so glad that they went through it. A mother feels that way. At least a decent mother feels that way. And we feel that way too as Christians. It's worth the pain, the frustration, the persecution that we go through for being holy because we're drawn closer to Christ. And the next time you get down alone with Jesus in the word and prayer, you're going to have, you're going to say, it was worth it because I get the fellowship with you, Jesus, and I know that I did what was right in your eyes, even though it wasn't easy. And that's just in this life. The next life is where it's really going to have the big payoff for us. 22, therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. They're already starting to feel sad because of all the stuff that Jesus is saying. And what he is saying is that living for him is going to be worth it. And the hatred and the hard times and the sacrifice that you may be asked to endure by God because you're living for Christ is going to be worth it when you see Jesus for the first time. When we see the scars in his hands and feet, we get that first glimpse of those things. When we see those scars that came from the cross, we're going to wish that we had endured more for him. No one will ever be able to take our joy away from us on that day. So God is really offering you and I a good deal. It's a good deal to be a Christian, live for Christ, suffer and sacrifice if need be. Still a good deal because you're going to be extremely happy for all eternity. It's a much better deal than Satan offers his followers. Take a little bit of fun that sin brings you right now, temporary, put up with the physical and mental aftermath of it, and then die and go to hell. That's not a good deal. That's a bad deal. 
23, and in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Jesus will not be around in person like he has been for the previous three years. So the apostles will not be able to look at him, look him in the eye and ask for something like they have been for three years. That's what he's talking about. You won't be able to do that. You won't be able to ask me for anything. But you will be able to talk to the Father in prayer and ask him for things in my name. 24. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Jesus, con Jesus connects the subject of prayer with the subject of joy here. God wants his people to have joy even amid suffering or frustration for doing things the right way when the world is doing things the wrong way. He still wants us to have joy even in the midst of that. And one of the greatest sources of joy is to ask is to ask God to do something that you know Jesus would ask for because that's what it means to pray to God in Jesus' name. It is to search the Bible, find out what you know Jesus would ask for, and then ask for it. And he will do it. And when God answers yes, your joy is going to go through the roof. See, that's the kind of stuff that God offers. Not the pleasures of sin for a season, followed by trouble in this life and in the next. God offers us a great deal, and heaven too. Satan offers us a bad deal, and hell to boot. Study all of God's word with me at thebibleversebyverse.com. Choose, click, and listen from four complete series, going on five, going through the entire Bible, verse by verse. If you'd like to be a part of Scripture verse by verse, it's very easy. You can do it right now. Pray for me and God's word. Please do that. And please do it right now because I know how easy it is to forget stuff. And then write a note. Put it on the refrigerator door or on your bathroom mirror. Pray for Mike. Pray for scripture verse by verse. Pray for the word of God. Would you do that, please? That makes you such an important part of this ministry. And don't forget to study God's word with me at thebibleversebyverse.com. You need to be fed the word of God. And there's nothing like studying the whole counsel together, the whole counsel of God together. That's the best thing we can do. And when you take a break from studying, go to the front page, click the donate button, and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead, because that also makes you a part of this ministry. Until next time, Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.